Okay, so welcome everyone. And thank you for coming to Green Home NYC's February Forum is Hydroelectricity Clean Energy. My name is Lisa Harrison. I'm new to Green Home NYC. I'm a new volunteer. And helping me with tonight's event is Gregory Thomas, who's a longtime Green Home NYC volunteer and current board member. Hey, Gregory. Hey, <laughs> folks. Really <laughs> great help uh, with all the techie parts of this. <laughs> OK. Uh, Green Home NYC is an all-volunteer nonprofit organization that has been promoting sustainability and energy efficiency and supporting green professional development since 2002. We have three main programs. The Green Careers Program typically hosts events on the second Tuesday of the month. These are great for people interested in starting or transitioning into a career related to sustainability. The month monthly forum program hosts events typically on the third Wednesday of the month. Each forum focuses on a different topic pertaining to environmental sustainability. Green Building Tours provides opportunities to get a closer look at energy efficient buildings and sustainability focused businesses. You can learn more at greenhomenyc.org where you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get updates on events and stories on recent legislation, community action and other initiatives that pertain to our mission. If you're interested in volunteering, speaking, writing, or contributing to future events, please reach out to us by emailing forums at greenhomenyc.org. So on to today's topic, is hydroelectricity green energy? So following in her predecessor's footsteps, Governor Hochul has moved forward on the Hydro-Quebec and Blackstone project the Champlain Hudson Power Express, known as Chippy, which will import hydroelectricity from Canadian mega dams. NYSERDA has drafted a 25 year contract to buy electricity from Hydro Quebec, which will be transported over a 339 mile high voltage transmission line owned by Blackstone, about 100 miles of which will be buried in the Hudson River. The contract has now been submitted to the Public Service Commission for approval. In our forum tonight, we'll discuss what this plan will entail and explore whether Canadian Hydro is in fact clean energy. If you have questions, please write them in the chat and the speakers will answer them during the Q&A which follows the presentation. So we have three wonderful speakers. So without further ado, it is my honor to present our first speaker, Professor of Earth Sciences at MIT, Bradford Hager. You have the floor, Brad. Great, thanks, Lisa. Uh, I hope I also uh, can share my screen successfully. Okay, how about that? Is that working? Yep, that's great. great. Yeah, okay, so thanks. Good post. All right, sorry about that. Thanks, Lisa, uh, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward to the other presentations, and I very much help that I, I hope that I can be helpful in uh, helping you understand the uh, question of whether uh, Hydro Quebec is uh, green hydropower. Uh, so I want to start out by just letting you know where I'm coming from. Um, you know, greenhouse gases are a huge problem. Uh, the emissions must be reduced, uh, but I'm a scientist, and so my, uh, you know, my basically uh, philosophy is that we have difficult choices, uh, and these choices must be informed by the best available science uh, that we can uh, do, and facts matter. So good science includes research, it includes discussion, it includes publication in peer-reviewed uh, uh, journals. And it also includes airing a wide range of perspectives. So I'll be airing my perspectives tonight, but these are not the only perspectives there are. Also, I feel that education is critical. Uh, as part of my work at MIT, I've started an undergraduate course on earth science, energy, and the environment. And in this course, uh, we examine critically 
all the various energy sources uh, that we're using or that we most might use, uh, each of these has uh, pluses and minuses, but uh, you know, they say you learn by teaching and it was by teaching the uh, implications of hydropower that I actually began to research this topic and, and learn a lot about it. So uh, I have formal ed uh, education in the classroom and I also feel that it's very important to do these uh, public outreach, uh, speak in webinars, op-eds, give testimony at reviews and so forth. Uh, so just another few caveats. Uh, none of my publications is on hydropower. The only thing I've done is public is uh, you know talks and op-eds and so forth. But my current research is focused on greenhouse gas reduction. So I, I'm very attuned to the problem. Uh, also, much of my research uh, involves modeling noisy and undersamp undersampled data. And so I understand uh, uncertainties in measurement. I understand how to propagate uncertainties. And considering these uncertainties is, is absolutely crucial. Uh, I want to say that uh, Hydro-Quebec and some environmentalists disagree strongly with me. And so, for example, I, I've got a list of references at the end, and there is, you know, a YouTube uh, video available by uh, uh, another uh, professor, uh, Paul Stancioff and Alain Tremblay, the chief scientist at Hydro-Quebec. So if you want to hear the uh, opposing viewpoint, uh, you can get that video. And I've actually uh, pirated a, a couple uh, slides from, from this, uh, their presentation. Okay, so what I'm going to try to do tonight is first provide a general framework for thinking about the problem. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce the observations, the noisy observations that we make on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I'll show you some of the details of how I research, uh, how I reach my conclusions. And then uh, I hope to try to answer any questions that you might have. I, I'll, I'll do my best. So we all know that hydropower is green, right? I mean, that's what I learned in school. Uh, that's what we what the New York politicians uh, believe, and that's certainly what Hydro-Quebec is telling us. But there's been uh, a lot of recent scientists beginning at the beginning of this uh, century uh, that has begun to challenge this uh, conventional wisdom that we were all taught in school. And uh, there are an increasing number of measurements that are being made, and there's uh, increased compilation and analysis of this data, and I'll be talking about some of that tonight. So, one of the main points I'm going to make is that the greenhouse gas footprint of hydro reservoirs varies by a huge amount, by a factor of 10,000. Uh, and I'm going to explain uh, why that is. And so what that means is that you know, some reservoirs are very, very clean. Others are very dirty. They're even dirtier than coal. So it's very important to consider the circumstances of the reservoirs that are generating the power that we're going to consume. Uh, and at the end of my talk, I'll show you an analysis uh, taking into account the best available data that we have on uh, Hydro-Quebec reservoirs. And this suggests that uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from uh, the best measured uh, reservoir they've, that they've got is about that of a uh, natural gas combined cycle power plant. So just uh, uh, shipping the, uh, you know, the uh, generation of the electricity to Quebec uh, as opposed to uh, generating it locally with uh, natural gas does not really uh, improve our uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so here is uh, an important uh, graph that is put out by the hydro industry, by the uh, International uh, Hydropower Association. And so what's plotted on this uh, chart on the horizontal axis is the greenhouse gas footprint, or specifically the carbon footprint of various reservoirs. The dots are the reservoirs. So this footprint is measured in the amount of carbon dioxide measured in grams per kilowatt hour of uh, electricity that's generated. So that's the horizontal axis. It goes uh, from point, 0 0.1 to 10,000, so a huge range there, and then up on top here are other kind of alternative power sources like coal, for example, is up here at about a thousand. So there are some reservoirs that are dirtier than coal. Uh, wind is here at you know about ten uh, of these units. So there are even some hydro reservoirs that are that are cleaner uh, than wind. Plotted on the vertical axis is a quantity again uh, you know spanning orders of magnitude, which is the uh, power density, and that. 
measure is how many watts of power you get per square meter of the reservoir. So if you have a small reservoir that's generating a lot of power, uh, it plots high on this plot. And if you have a large reservoir, uh, large area that's not generating very much power, it, it plots down on the bottom here. So basically an example of uh, a good reservoir in the uh, upper left corner is this reservoir in Switzerland, which is up in the mountains. It dams a very narrow valley. So there's a very small surface area and it has a, uh, a very high, a very large drop. So something like uh, 300 meters of, of, of drop going from the top to the bottom of this reservoir. So huge amount of power generated for a very small surface area. On the other side over here is um, Hydro-Quebec Reservoir. They tend to plot down here in the lower right. And, and these are uh, it, uh, reservoirs that are not very deep. Uh, so they don't generate a lot of power per unit area. And they are, they are very large in aerial extent. So, uh, and so basically what I'm gonna do is try to you know, explain this, this variation from reservoir to reservoir and pin down specifically on this graph where various hydro, uh, Quebec hydro reservoirs are. Okay, so uh, just to summarize uh, what you know, I think you should learn uh, what I've already said, this very large variation, but there are three main factors that control this greenhouse gas emissions. And the first is the area of the forest that's flooded by the building of these reservoirs. So the area of the forest flooded per kilowatt hour generated uh, is the most important factor. And that's because building a hydro reservoir leads to deforestation, just like burning the Amazon leads to deforestation. So you're removing these trees. Uh, so hydro from damming narrow steep valleys above tree line is clean, that from damming broad forested lowlands is, is dirty. A second factor is that the age of the reservoir is important. And for reasons that I'll explain shortly, new reservoirs emit much more carbon dioxide than old reservoirs. And that's because when this flooding occurs, uh, the carbon which is in the forest eventually gets, you know, uh, decays and gets back into the atmosphere. And that, that, that takes some decades to do. And the third important factor is the, uh, the temperature uh, because the temperature affects the density of the, of, of the trees. Uh, it affects how much methane is produced. Uh, low temperature is better, high temperature is worse. The worst reservoirs in the world are in Brazil, uh, where it's very warm, a uh, lot of uh, biomass is flooded. I think it's important in understanding any claims about the greenhouse gas footprint that the, is to understand that there are very large uncertainties in the measurements of these fluxes, and I'll show you some examples of those. Uh, but at the end, uh, the, the main point is that power uh, from the new Hydro-Quebec reservoir that was built to supply power to New England uh, emits much more than the median value, value of CO2 in that plot that I showed you. It's 20 to 30 times dirtier than wind. It's two to 20 times uh, dirtier than solar and it's comparable to natural gas combined cycle and the amount of uh, greenhouse gas and uh, uh, CO2 emissions. Okay, why do I keep harping on, on the surface area and, and, uh, and trees and so forth? And that's uh, summarized in this plot, and that is before flooding, uh, the vegetation, the trees and the shrubs are stripping carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. And that happens by photosynthesis. And some of that is used to build the tree to make the leaves, but a lot of it goes into the root system and underground and ends up with this uh, carbon, which is organically bound uh, in the, in the uh, soil. So a typically boreal forest, uh, Hydro-Quebec, would, uh, uh, there would be about a thousand tons of uh, CO2 uh, being stored every, uh, every year per every square kilometer. Uh, typically uh, about uh, a fifth of that is in, in the uh, tree itself, and about uh, four fifths of it is underground, uh, you know, put together in stems, leaves, roots, and soil. Uh, you know, the branches fall off, there's, there's decay, but uh, up in this area, uh, any litter that lies on the ground uh, stays there a very long time if it, if it doesn't get uh, too wet. So here's an example. Uh, this is me 50 years ago uh, on a canoe trip up in northern Quebec, uh, and we came across uh, basically these pieces of wood, these crosses that were parts of a, a grave that had been uh, 
had been made like 50 years previously. So these things last a long time if they're not disturbed. Okay, so then a reservoir is built. We end up flooding deforestation. We stop this ongoing storage of CO2. Uh, the veg vegetation decays uh, sometimes in the form of, of these trees that decay slowly. But the crucial thing is that all this, you know, four times as much carbon, which is stored in the soils, that is churned up by the waves, by the water level going up and down, up and down over the years. And this organic uh, material eventually ends up in, in the atmosphere. So as an example, uh, hydro Quebec's largest reservoir is actually built in Labrador, but it supplies power to, uh, to Quebec, uh, is up here on the border between uh, Quebec and, and Labrador. Uh, the black area shows the lake that was there uh, before the reservoir was built. And this gray area represents the amount of uh, uh, area or is the area that was flooded by the building of this uh, small wood reservoir, which is, was built to provide the uh, water for the Churchill Falls power plant. 4,000 square kilometers of forest were drowned by the building of this reservoir. That's a huge amount. 4,000 kilometers would be 4 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, that would have been removed from the atmosphere uh, before they you know, built this, uh, before they flooded this reservoir. So it's, it's a big uh, impact on the carbon budget. All right, so how do we estimate the uh, amount of carbon that's uh, coming out uh, of these reservoirs? Well, we go out and we measure and we uh, estimate the amount of CO2 that's coming out of the reservoir every day per square meter of reservoir area. So that's uh, measured in terms of grams of carbon dioxide per square meter per day. Uh, it's very difficult to make this measure, uh, measurement directly. Uh, it's more straightforward to measure the amount of uh, CO2 uh, in the water and do some uh, calculations to figure out because it varies with season, wind, temperature, and so forth. So we know then the CO2 uh, per unit area, we determine the area of the reservoir. And it's important to realize that, you know, that area varies with the water level. And the area that's killed off and where the carbon is coming out is actually the, uh, the, the high water mark, uh, not the low water mark or the intermediate water mark. So there's a, a large area uh, that's flooded. We then determine the amount of electricity that's generated per year. And so that's measured in terms of kilowatt hours per year. That of course differs from year to year because we all know that you know, some years are wet years, some years are dry years. So sometimes they get more power, sometimes they get less power. But in the end, you just combine these two. Uh, and this is where you get the grams of carbon dioxide uh, per kilowatt hour, uh, which I'm showing you on, on, on these plots. So we go from a measurement of the carbon dioxide flux times the area, scale that to the number of days in a year and then divide by the total power. So here's an example. This is a slide from Hydro-Quebec uh, showing some of these measurements being made. And so here's uh, somebody out, out at a float plane on the middle of a lake measuring uh, carbon dioxide flux. Here's some guys in a raft uh, in a uh, you know, flooded swamp measuring methane fluxes. So this is how the measurements are made. Uh, it's important though to realize that the amount of carbon dioxide that comes out depends on how fast the wind's blowing. So it's like if you have a bowl of hot soup and you want to cool it down fast, you blow over it. So if you want to get the carbon dioxide out fast, you blow over it with a strong wind. So here are two pictures I've taken uh, up in that area. Uh, on the left uh, is a, a nice calm day when the CO2 flux is low. On the right is a windy day when the CO2 uh, flux is uh, very high, okay? And unfortunately, you can't measure the flux on the windy day because it's not safe to be out there working. So the measurements of flux are actually biased towards these low values uh, caused by calm days, because you know, when you can only measure on calm days. Okay, so there's variation from windy to calm. There's also a variation uh, through the year, and that's caused by in the winter, there's ice over the reservoir, the CO2 can't get out, the, uh, dense water is at the bottom, so the CO2 is accumulating at, at the bottom. And then when the spring melt comes, there's a big overturn of the reservoir, and that CO2 at the bottom comes up and goes out the top. So on this top plot, I'm showing um, a, uh, a, a, a graph from this paper uh, 
showing variations from year to year, these continuous variations of the uh, CO2 concentrations in the water. And you can see it builds up in the wintertime, it uh, belches out in the, in the springtime, and then it goes down to a low value. The lower panel shows measurements that are made in field campaigns uh, as, as, as a function of time. So I'm gonna just spend a second on this. This particular graph, which I'll come back to later, is uh, a set of measurements made for a brand new reservoir that I'll be talking about. This value down here is before the reservoir was built. The flooding uh, caused all this vegetation to be uh, you know, uh, swept into the water, uh, decayed, so there's a lot of CO2 coming out. But then the CO2 you know, decays over a year or two and then you know, continues out. So the vertical bars here show the scatter in the measures. And so you can see that the measurements, the measurement uncertainty is, uh, is large. It's almost the factor of, uh, it's almost the size of the measurements themselves. The other important thing is that there's a time variation. The spring measurements are these high bars here and the late summer measurements are these low bars down here. So there's a, you know, you have to somehow make a calibration for the time of year that you make the measurement. And, and that's uh, very challenging to do. And as you can see from this plot, most of the measurements are made down here at this low level uh, late in the summer, uh, because that's the time it's safest to work in these areas. Excuse right. me. Yep. I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but it, um, the time is running late. If Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So I will. I wish we could listen the whole you know, yeah, hour. Yeah. All right. So, so let me just uh, skip a bunch of this stuff uh, and uh, come back down here. This slide is very important. Uh, it shows how this um, uh, scatter that we can see is related to the uh, topography. So if you want to think hydroelectric, mountainous sites are clean. Uh, sites in the river valleys are, are uh, not so clean. And finally, I'm gonna show you uh, a study here uh, of this reservoir that I just talked about, this East Main Reservoir, uh, a bunch of data collected by Hydro-Quebec. Uh, they made a lot of measurements. Uh, and at the end, they made measurements for four years. They fit a model to it and extrapolated it for a hundred years. Uh, the red line here is the power coming out of a, a natural gas combined cycle plant. The blue and the black lines are their theoretical uh, extrapolation. On the right side, they show the cumulative uh, emissions. And so from this, they concluded that the total cumulative emissions uh, of this reservoir were about half of that of the natural gas combined cycle. But uh, these measurements were made uh, following that publication of that paper. Um, and uh, basically the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the bottom line is that the um, CO2 emissions uh, as measured by that later paper are about uh, a factor of two higher, uh, giving this uh, estimated carbon footprint of this East Main Reservoir uh, of uh, about that of a, a natural gas combined cycle power plant. So this you know, shows some of the other estimates that have been made uh, up here at the top is uh, one particular reservoir which has about twice the emissions of, of uh, coal. Okay, so I'll skip this and uh, just uh, I can come back down here and uh, just end that right there. If we have time for questions, I'll take them later, but uh, thanks and uh, sorry to run over time. Great, thank you. Thank you, Brad. And um, I'm sure we'll have questions for you. Yep. <laughs> uh, our, next, our next speaker is Senior Habitat Restoration Manager at Riverkeeper. It is my great pleasure to welcome George Jackman. Take it away, George. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Green Home New York City for inviting us to speak tonight. I'm gonna, tonight, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Can everybody, can you see Lisa? Yes. Okay. So, I'm uh, fascinated by fishes, and as you can see, the different patterns on these fishes uh, make them blend into their environment quite well. And as you can see, it's a stark contrast from the cable that they'll be inserting 
into the water. I'm the Senior Habitat Restoration Manager for Riverkeeper and is hydroelectricity clean? Are you kidding me? So anyway, September 11th for the Hudson River began in 1609. You know, when Henry Hudson first sailed into the Hudson River, that was the first September 11th. And uh, Robert Jewett was his navigator and he was actually a mutineer on his next uh, voyage. Uh, when he was stranded in Hudson's Bay and he and his son. But nevertheless, uh, when he sailed up the Hudson River, Robert Jouett said the river is filled with fish. And he said the sky is filled with birds for minutes at a time and the country is beyond compare. And uh, what they remarked was there was an infinitude of fish in the river. Well, if you look at Eric Sanderson's image of Manhattan, you know, uh, prior to 1609, uh, compared to what it looks like today, you know, that's why it was filled with fish. For the native influences on the ecological integrity and the river, the coastline and the, and the watershed were very minor in comparison. So for the first 12,000 years of human use, the Hudson River was, uh, a, was pristine, essentially. It was a source of water and food and transportation. Upon the settlement with uh, the Europeans, all that attitude towards the landscape changed and possession of the land counted for everything. And, uh, you know, man's domination over the environment you know, an un, you know, uh, a river that wasn't tamed with a dam was considered unproductive. So now what is the Hudson River? They're trying to make it into a giant electrical conduit. So this is the iconic sign where we see all over the Hudson Valley. Uh, it's the Hudson River estuary and it's our image of the sturgeon. So let's talk about some of the fish. The Hudson River fish community is unstable and so is the river. So in contrast to what Robert Jewett mentioned, Atlantic sturgeon are endangered. Short-nosed sturgeon are endangered. Rainbow smelt are no longer found in the Hudson. They left due to climate change. American shad are depleted. They're down anywhere from 95 to 99 percentile. Alewife are depleted. Same thing, 95 to 99 percentile. Blueback herring are depleted, 95 to, 95, 95 to 99 percentile uh, declines. American eels down 75 percentile, they're depleted. Winter flounder, and we'll go back to American eels, they're being eaten to death in the sushi trade. Uh, winter flounder, depleted. Well, there's a lot of things occurring with uh, American eels, but I'll get into that later on. Winter flounder, they're depleted and they're suffering from uh, in breeding depression, they're at historically low levels and they're not coming back. Um, then we have tomcat is also va vanishing. It's, uh, it's a cold water fish, they call it frost fish. Climate change is gonna push winter uh, flounder and tomcat out, but they're both suffering from human or anthropogenic changes. White catfish in significant decline, white perch in decline, striped bass in decline, they're overfished by anglers. <clears throat> Brook trout are, are, have severe range restrictions and they're down about 95% their pristine habitat. And oysters, they're a story unto themselves. They were effectively extirpated from New York uh, Harbor and the Hudson. And French water mussels, many species are, are in decline. And one, the alewife floater is down 96 percentile. So what is a, an estuary? It's, an estuary is where the river meets the sea. And the Hudson River forms the largest spawning ground uh, and fish nursery on the east coast of the United States. But estuaries are amazing places. They're the integration of land, water, ocean, river. And there's a continuum as the river matures and flows downstream to the sea. Ironically, a lot of our diadromous fish capitalize on that continuum and they tuck their fish <clears throat> into the headwaters and as they mature, they move downstream with the maturity of the river as it heads towards the sea. And by the time they're ready to hit the sea, they have matured uh, physically. So many species exploit the productivity and the safety of this offspring in comparison to the ocean. So their productivity, these are some of the most 
um, productive habitats on the planet equal in carbon productivity to that of the Amazonian rainforest. And the, the Hudson River has the distinction of being the largest Superfund site and the fish are no longer suitable for, its super, uh, for human consumption due to PCBs. And the Hudson River's most iconic fishes as we saw are in various states of decline. And for all its importance, for what it does as the second largest estuary, it's being asked to subsidize human whim, despite centuries, four centuries of abuse and neglect. But the Hudson River um, is light limited. It characteristically, there's very little light deeper than 10 feet. And it receives tremendous amounts of sediment from the tributaries. So then how do fish navigate in this dark, murky, featureless environment. Well, what they do is they use this Earth's magnetic fields and they use that as a form of GPS or compass. And especially migratory species, they realize they can cue into the Earth's migratory field for direct for position and directionality. What they've also recent research in uh, fairly recent was in nature uh, 2014, they found that weak electromagnetic fields uh, disrupt the compass used by uh, migratory birds, robins and other songbirds. So what we know is many fishes, especially the migratory fishes can detect the, the Earth's geomagnetic fields. Again, it provides position and directionality in this featureless environment. So picture yourself uh, in an environment where you can't see due to the sediment or the darkness. How do you navigate? How do migratory fish know to go back to their natal rivers? So what we're finding out with recent research is uh, varieties of fish, crustacean, birds, mammals, all use the Earth's geomagnetic fields for orientation and navigation. It is even believed that birds can visualize the magnetic fields. And fish possessing, uh, possessing these specialized uh, electrosensory organs can perceive uh, magnetic fields via these electroreceptors. And so that what they have, a lot of fish have this onboard map and compass system or more equivalent to a GPS. Sturgeon utilize what they call um, uh, ampullae of Lorenzini and they locate prey and and you put them in a magnetic field, they'll exhibit altered behavior. And what they can detect is uh, very fine electrical impulses in their prey. And same thing with like hammerhead sharks or rays have that same ability. But we must respect our elders. If we look at the sturgeon in the Hudson River, uh, the whole lineage is 280 million years they've been on Earth. And our sturgeon, the Atlantic sturgeon that I'm holding on in the, on the right hand side, that's a male sturgeon. They're both male sturgeons and both, both fishes uh, were tagged under a federal permit. None of them were harmed. We certainly don't want to harm the, the sturgeon in our river. And they're 100 million, these fish are not 100 million years. Their lineage is about 100 million years. They've been using coastal rivers, Atlantic sturgeon and short nose sturgeon. And they've been around since the time of the dinosaurs. And so we have two species in the sturgeon, uh, of sturgeon in the Hudson. And we have the short nose and the Atlantic, and both are listed as endangered. How did that happen? Well, when your eggs are considered a delicacy, it was called black gold in the 1880s. And their meat was called Albany beef. And so they were just harvested in mass. And by the 1900s, there were very little less left and they really have not recovered. So this is a sturgeon up close. And as you can see, look at that face and you can see the barbel below and it's actually a beautiful animal. And so if you look at the, the rostrum on that fish or the nose, you would see it's covered with these spiracles. And those spiracles are part of this jelly filled uh, sensory organ, the, this electrical sensors. So between the barbels and the electrical sensors, they're highly sensitive to electromagnetic fields. And um, so they can detect the Earth's back uh, geomagnetic magnetic fields and EMF from transmission cables mimics the Earth's magnetic fields. So what we fear is 
it may cause disorientation for these fish. And so they use that barbel, as I'm pointing to, for taste and as a feeler when they're on the bottom. Again, they're in a light limited world. So we know that sturgeon alter their behavior in response to electromagnetic fields. However, the National Marine Fishery Service uh, created critical habitat for the threatened green sturgeon on the Pacific coast. They provided a safe migratory corridor to protect them, protect them from electric uh, transmission lines and to protect them from EMF. They were concerned that their migration routes might be altered by all the EMF around the coast. And we know that many species use the magnetic field to navigate. And what the fear is for us is that these electrical cables may disrupt adaptive and timeless travel paths, the, their migration patterns. And there's much uncertainty with regard to the fish themselves. So if green sturgeon are given critical uh, habitat, what about the Atlantics and short nose in the Hudson? Don't they deserve a safe migratory corridor too? Instead of putting a cape, an electric cord, uh, the length of the Hudson River, why don't they deserve it? We know EMF disrupt, if, well, well, what we're saying is if EMF disrupts spawning activity and damages their eggs or harms their young a year, we won't know the impacts for 20 years because they have a very slow generational time. They, it takes the females 20 years to mature. They live to almost 100 years old. There was one recently spotted in the Hudson about 14 feet long and about 750 pounds. So it takes them a long time. Then there's striped bass. This is our, probably our most popular. They have uh, the same pattern as the Yankees. They're, so they're very popular. I think that maybe it's because of that pattern, who knows? But as you can see, I'm holding this sturgeon when we, it was, that's in the Hudson behind her, way up uh, river. And these fish are now in decline, they're overfished. The Hudson is their largest, second largest spawning ground. They have semi-buoyant eggs that drift downstream with the currents and the, the larvae hatch uh, and drift downstream. If there was a cable, they would be constantly exposed to EMFs. But they're in long-term de decline. If you look at this graph on the left, we'll see the green line is the target. The dotted line is their threshold, and we could see where their population is. They're way below, they're actually crashing. So they're doing everything they can. There's even talk that they might stop all fishing for them in, in their estuaries. So then there's American eels. These are down 75%. This is a glass eel in my hand as I'm about to put it over a dam. Dams block their passage. Uh, and here's a, a, one of the largest females ever caught in the Hudson uh, River in the Hudson watershed, that's a, I believe it was a 72 centimeter female and she was trapped below that dam. At one time they comprised 25% of all the biomass in the st streams. Their populations are now depleted according to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. They spawn once and die, we call that semal parity and the declines are due to dams, turbines, overfishing. Most, the, the biggest loss, one third of their loss is due to hydroelectric power. Actually, it's the, it's the Moses Dam on the St. Lawrence River blocked their passage into the Great Lakes. 50% of the eels now have a Japanese swim bladder uh, parasite, a nematode, uh, acrasis, and it could be even up as high as 75% now. Each dam blocks 95% of their upstream movement, but we found out in a recent study that approximately 40% of the eels would not cross a high voltage cable. So if 40% don't cross, how will they be affected by a cable that's running the length of a river? This was in San Francisco Bay. They wouldn't cross uh, a cable that was near the outlet. So if 40% wouldn't cross, how are they going to be affected by a cable running 118 miles? So then there's American Shad, Alosa sapidissima. As you can see, it, it is most delicious. Uh, it's the largest of, of the herrings built for speed and long distance migrations. It's uh, anadromous, they spawn like uh, 
the striped bass and the sturgeon spawn in fresh water. Anadromy was a brilliant strategy until people came along. And now migratory fish or a diadromous fish across the world are now in decline. They're down 85% in the past 30 years. American shad were once known to swim 300 miles each direction during their migratory run. They would swim almost to Cooperstown up the Susquehanna River. And um, now uh, they're, they're blocked over 60% over of their habitat. In the Hudson, they've experienced failed recruitment for the past 20 years. They've lost about 40% of their habitat and the populations are depleted down 99 to 95 to 99 percentile. And if you recognize that, what, and can anybody tell us what subway stop that is in New York City? Yes, it's Delancey Street. So there's a mosaic. These are also one of my favorites. These are river herring. I took these photos of them in the tributaries. They're depleted, they're down nine, 95 to 99 to percentile. Again, same thing, over harvest, bycatch dams, uh, all these things are adding up. Their populations are small, they're less resilient, they're gonna have subject to environmental and evolutionary changes. And both species, shad and river herring, exhibit natal fidelity. So how will high voltage cables affect them? Will they lose their rivers? Will they become disoriented? If I messed with the GPS in your car, how will you get where you wanna go? And that's essentially what the cables will do to them. And then what is the impact of uh, um, EMF to their developing eggs, larvae, and young of year? If we have any further declines, it would be catastrophic to the ecosystem. Then there's blue crabs. These are, it's called beautiful swimmer or Kalanectes sapidus, which means savory. And they're uh, a pugnacious little creature. And uh, boy, they'll give you a nasty bite, but I love them. And uh, they are, I hate, hate to say it, they are good eating in a red sauce. But anyway, they are a migratory species. They're born out. They, they could also be considered catadromous. They're born out in the ocean. And the females move upstream of, into the fresh water. And the jimmies are waiting for them, and they, they move way upstream into the tributaries. And what we found out in a recent study that came out in 2021, crabs become mesmerized by uh, electromagnetic fields from cables, and they choose to remain at the cables then instead of migrating. So what Scott et al. 2021 said, EMF could have a pro profound effect on the crabs mating uh, migration and foraging activity. And it causes, could lead to changes in cellular changes, uh, lower blood counts, making them more vulnerable to infections. And they would have problems with uh, oxygen uptake and changes in sugar metabolism. Look sorry, at this beauty. George, this, George, excuse me, yes? sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, could you wrap up? So I will wrap up. These are brook trout. Research shows that low magnetic fields alter their embryonic development, organogenesis, circulation patterns, and cause anxiety, behavioral changes, and dis disorientation. And then uh, with smolts of uh, small uh, young salmon, they discovered an 11.2% decrease in the proportion of salmon exiting the bay. So what's the problem? Uh, Chippy said there'd be very few impacts. That's doubtful. And it's going to run 118 miles. But in 2017, the entire Hudson River was declared critical habitat for sturgeon and for both uh, short nose and Atlantic sturgeon. So all types of electric uh, cables will emit uh, electromagnetic fields into the surrounding waters and they will create magnetic fields and the fish, they will induce a, a secondary electric field into the fish. And so what we know is we recommend, Chippy says they're very six feet, we, at the minimum we recommend 12 feet. But the problem is we know all these different fe uh, species uh, are affected by that, but a recent study by uh, Hutchinson et al cannot be ruled out there may be long-term physiological, biochemical or behavioral, behavioral changes as a result uh, of EMF and different life stages. Um, 
So then there's this jet plowing. What it's going to do is how they're going to do it. The, they're going to run this down this critical habitat to lay the cable. And they're going to cross 11 miles of bedrock, 66 cables, pipelines, other cable, and 26 other cables. So PCBs and toxins will be resuspended. And then they're going to put concrete mattresses. TDI says, uh, that's uh, the company uh, owned by Blackstone, says the mats will create reef-like conditions. And they may develop a, a community on, on them, an epibenthic community. Would you want to build a 1250 mega, uh, megawatt uh, cable where, and have fish spawn on that? These mattresses will leak EMF because uh, it's only like a foot thick. Would anybody place their child on that cable? So the end of Chippy is good for the Hudson and the environment. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank That's you, George. Thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting. I wish you all had a, like an hour apiece. But um, our final speaker is very active in her community and a board member of the Stony Point Action Committee for the Environment, also known as SPACE. It is my great pleasure to present Susan Filgaris. Am I on, right? You're on. <laughs> thank you, sorry. Lisa, thank you very much. And, and uh, a couple, I guess they're smart aleck remarks. Not only are they gonna jet plow the river, they're gonna go across the double Ramapo fault. They're gonna blast that Iona Island, which they're not telling everybody. And they're gonna bury it three feet under Route 9W and we're gonna put our children over that line every day. Anyway, thank you for allowing me to speak. Lisa, thank you for the invitation. Stony Point Action Committee for the Environment Space has been around for 32 years. And I wanna be very clear, and, and uh, Mr. Jackman, thank you for saying that. This is a Blackstone-owned TDI Champlain Hudson Power Express. It is literally a extension cord that is 1,250 megawatts at the moment. I'd like you to know that since 2010, when the project was introduced in the, in the United States, that space immediately got together, formed groups, formed the Just Saying No to the Champlain Hudson Power Express Committee. And by October 23, 2012, we hosted the New York State Stand, Senate Standing Committee on Energy and Telecommunications. We had over 300 people there and we had involved our senators, our assembly people. Um, we had participation. And this is us as our Just Say No committee. The gentleman standing was an electrician by trade and was trying to explain why it was a bad idea. The gentleman at the end, his name is Barry Brooks and is a son of the American Revolution and can trace his family back. And his family is buried in the Waldron Revolutionary Cemetery, which Chippy said, oh, we'll just shoot a bullet through the cemetery. And when I asked him how deep, he said three feet, what's the problem? We had to explain to him that it would be over our dead body, but he didn't seem to appreciate it. Uh, real we, quick, Susan, were there yes. any of your um, documents you wanted to be showing right now? Aren't I on? I'm not on. Oh, your, your video is on. But not my, your my, no, the power. Oh, now I lost it. The PowerPoint, right? Yes. I'm going quick. I don't want to get thrown off by Lisa. Um, we also had resolutions for all of you to know. We had our legislators. We had, we did it, and we yelled and we shouted and we had some union. We had no union, and what it comes down to is everything I'm going to say here tonight. There's a document for. Um, this is the Department of Energy. This project is governed at the New York state level and at the federal level. And Blackstone hid for a number of years. They didn't want anybody to know they own Chippy. But what they're doing, Blackstone is one of the world's largest equity banks. They are one of the New York City's largest landlords. They own Stuyvesant Town. And here's a little known fact. 
They manage a very large portion of New York State's pension funds. Do you think we might have a conflict of interest? But the commission, when this is pointed out, has ignored that. And I'll give you one other little tidbit. The Blackstone Group financially managed the Mirant Bowline and Lovett Power Plant bankruptcy. How much market intelligence did they get prior to buying Chippy? Chippy, they bought Chippy, it was introduced in the United States in January of 2010. Their name was attached to it at that point. They had worked through several subsidiary companies for years because the unions had a problem with it. And this year, when they rescinded and reissued the, pres the presidential permit, they claim they own. Now, the one thing I did do, because I'm going to talk quick, I don't want to get thrown off, um, is that you option. Oh, boy, here we go. I put together so that you know, and I can't find it, a um, link. I've got links to most of what I'm talking about. They are active and you will be able, I don't know where it went. Can you find it? It's in a folder on my desk. Does this look like here? What, uh, That's, it. See what's That's it, presenting? perfect. So I have given this to Lisa. All of the links are active. And as I talk, you, thank you. You will see, now if I figure out how to turn it, we'll be good. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting it here, so you can let me know about that. Uh, yeah, just forward. flip the pages so people can see what's here. We Now hold right there. One of the things we have to talk about tonight, and I really want to hammer away at it, is that New York State has been bought and sold like a piece of stale bread. And it's absolutely disgusting. And it's done through these IDA applications. But if we can go back to the other green presentation, where did we go? The other one. Nope. Yep. Okay. I'm just going to. All right. This is us as we spoke in front of the, the Senate hearing. When we sat down, I want you to know the national head for the unions in the United States came up to the table and said, I don't think I have anything else to say. They covered it. We meant what we said and, and we wanted to be heard. And I can't turn the pages here. So you want to. I can move this forward. Yep. Resolutions at the state, at our legislative level. Go ahead, keep going. This is where you can find the application and I will make sure you have all these links. The Department of Energy has a wonderful timeline to how this project was in fact approved. The environmental, the fish, the birds. And by the way, folks, we have had such a wonderful reemergence of the Native American bald eagle. It is stunning. One of the caveats to an eagle is that if you disturb their habitat, which is a fairly large area, they go away and never return. Chippy's going to blast. What's going to happen to our American bald eagle? Anyway, turn me over. I got to get to the IDAs. This is the New York State Public Service Commission Matter Master. Everything I speak of, the IDAs, the memorandums of understanding, are on. This web, well, should be on this website. So the link is active. You can find what we're looking for. Go ahead. This is what we're going to talk about today. And if I get, I'm partially Italian. If my hands fly and my voice gets loud, um, put earplugs in. The Champlain Hudson Power Express states, we will save you $650 million. The Champlain Hudson Power Express states, well, I'm going to do this and so Mr. Jackman and Mr. Hager can chuckle at me. We're green, we're environmental, we're hydropower. The only reason they can claim all that is they're in Canada. We don't regulate foreign nations. We're NIMBYs, not in our backyard, because we wouldn't build what they're building to do what they want to do. It's not green. It's just not built here. 
So Mr. Jackman and Mr. Hager, thank you so very much. That's the first lie. The second is the $650 million in savings. There are absolutely no savings to the consumer, none. This project is being represented falsely. In the Public Service Commission's Certificate for Environmental Capability, Compatibility and Public Need, point 108 states, because the project is expected to be financed on a merchant basis, the difference between the estimated costs of the two supply options should not be interpreted as ratepayer benefits. To the extent that prices for electricity are determined in the long run, the cost of constructing and operating a new unit, these production cost savings will be captured by the applicants and their financial backers. So how does it feel that Blackstone is telling you they're gonna make $650 million off in New York State just to build the line, not counting what they're going to charge us, charge us for it. They're claiming they're going to have jobs. It's an extension cord, it's buried. There are no jobs. In the final environmental impact statement on the DOE website, you can do the summary. I'll, I'll make sure I send that to Lisa so she can send it out to you guys. There are 26 jobs. Did I lose a zero or two? Where in God's name are we getting 2,400 jobs? They're not there. Additionally, what you're going to get is they will import the experienced labor and Americans will get the flagging jobs, the sweeping jobs, maybe some landscaping if we're lucky. So all of our elected officials who are out here who run us saying we're going to get, did they read anything? Did they read any of these documents? Because I can't make them up. There are no jobs. The savings go to Blackstone, not us. And just recently at NYSERDA, their New York State Energy Division Agency, there was a bid for power to be brought into New York State. The criteria is that we have to be green and Chippy claims they're green. Do you know that power is far more expensive than the rest of the power in the package? Why? Why did we buy that power? It's more expensive. There are no jobs. There are no savings to us. And we're going to pay them to build it. You can roll that slide over. I'll only get more emotional on everybody. Okay. Here is what they've done. The Champlain Hudson Power Express is owned by Blackstone. They're an equity company. What they do is they assess, they determine whether you're good at being kept together or broken up. So what they've done, and they started by trying to silence our environmental groups, is they created funds and they called them environmental protection funds, um, memorandums of understanding, route resolutions. What they are is bribes. They're going to pay our elected officials to dance to their tune to be paid our tax dollars back. How that's going to work, are you ready? There is something called an, indust uh, an industrial development agency. It is a governmental agency that uses our tax dollars to encourage businesses to come into our community and invest, to be sustainable, to build jobs, to build a future. Now, this is the world's, one of the world's largest equity companies. They went into our IDA organizations and said, if you don't give me back the money, we can't build our project. Now I have my glasses on and I'm in my 60s, I'm not deaf yet. They're one of the world's largest equity banks and they're taking our tax dollars through IDA. And if you'd like to know how they're doing this, this project 
was ushered through the entire process by former Governor Cuomo. Peter G. Peterson, the founder of the Blackstone Company, sat on Cuomo's first gubernatorial campaign. Bill Mulroe, who has been in and out of Albany consistently, is an ex-Blackstone management. And when he leaves New York government, he goes back to work for Blackstone. Cuomo brought him back after Sandy. He brought him back for COVID. And then Cuomo left and we still have Bill Monroe helping Governor Hochul. And we have Chippy. So it's a project that's been approved by our elected officials. Best yet is that with local law 97, the mayor of New York City had to get in it and state, hang on. <coughs> and state that this project would help close Indian Point. <coughs> Excuse me. Indian Point's closed. We don't have an electric problem. Somebody tell me what I missed. This project never was is not based on functional need. It's not based on physical need. It's based on a political definition of what need is. So they're going to build it. You wanna turn my slide? If I knew how to do it, I would. Oh, this is the Industrial Development Agency. All counties have one. What are the, what are the tools that they use to do this? They exempt the state sales and use tax. So, you know, when you go to the store and you pay, it's the items $12, but it's $12 plus 8.25% in taxes. Chippy's being, Chippy has replied in Rockland County, and I think I halted it. I'm not sure. Um, they want to be exempt. They want to be exempt to the tune of over $9 million. I can't yell any louder or get any more excited. They want to be exempt from $2 million worth of mortgage filing tax. How about you guys? Wouldn't you like to buy a house and not have to pay the mortgage filing tax? This is the world's largest bank. One of the world's. Let me say it that way. Now, real property tax agreements. This is called a pilot. Okay. A pilot is in lieu of. New York State standard, thank you. Um, pilots are negotiated agreements that establish the amount of percentages paid on set assessment values by the property owner. So what Chippy has done is they've gone to the IDA and said, look, we're not gonna pay those property taxes and we're gonna build this project. So I'm going to tell you what we're going to pay you. So we're losing what the actual value is. And we're being given what Chippy thinks we are. Now, um, when you look at this, I think you can go one more. This is an example of how Chippy has taken the IDA and the pay for performance business methodology to a fine level. The Mohawk Council has made an agreement with Hydro-Quebec and I have to take my glasses off to see what the dollar value is. Um, it's over a 40 year term and they've created a financial inducement for this particular tribe. There comes a point when you get backed into a corner and I'll give you the perfect example that you know that you've lost. That's what I believe this is. Because the devastation in Canada, environmentally, financially, uh, generationally, is devastating. If you want to go one over. In Queens, New York, they have a multitude of power plants. That entire area is just overwhelmed. Well, Chippy solved that problem because they were objecting to another plant. They've given them a $1.25 million grant to build a science station. So now the, the school districts are thrilled. Their politicians are going, look at how much money we have. 
isn't this great? We're paying you to shut up. Don't ask about our project. No one knows how it will be built. Mr. Jackman showed you plowsharing. I could show you a few more different movies and we'd all have a heart attack. We don't know what the construction plan is. We don't know what the construction plan is in the river or on land. And as a matter of fact, Chippy in 2019 filed and said, and I quote, we have our permit. There is no longer need for the public to know what we're doing. I think I have a problem with that. So Chippy has now learned they can set a precedent and say, we don't have to tell the public what's going on. Our elected officials, because they've signed agreements like this $1.25 million, they don't want to lose their money if you want to roll me over. Want to go ahead and roll that slide? Uh-uh. Okay. There go. Oh, there we go. Susan, is, we are yes. um, kind of running out of I'm time. Trying, I'm trying to get it done. But here's the point. Just let me make this point. No, I, I'm just, no, I'm going to let you make your point. But can you also say something about the MOUs before you finish? I, I'm, yeah. I, they, they were coming next. What they did, what they did, Jen White, who was the ex-mayor of Nyack, who took the job after she decided not to be mayor anymore, she took the job with Chippy while she was still mayor sometime in September, and her term wouldn't be up until November. She used her political connection to walk into our supervisors, mayors, so forth's office and say, guys, here's the deal. Either you take the MOU. What is the MOU? It is a behind closed door negotiation that came about because when Chippy first came down the river, they were coming out. I don't know how many people are familiar with the Stony Point Lighthouse, Indian Point, um, the Lovett plant. It's built right on the river. And the nightmare there, Mr. Jack, I could give Mr. Jackman nightmares for days. Uh, they were coming out, getting on the railroad. The right of way for this project is they're laying two cables that must be six feet apart. So you're looking at two, I need six feet to the outside, lay my cable, I need six feet for the first cable, six feet for the second cable, six feet to the outside. It's a 24 foot wide right of way. And they were asking for an additional 60 feet, meaning they can move it any way they wanted. We were losing homes. It was in people's front doors and it was plowing up the Waldron Cemetery. So what they did is they said, well, we'll put it on Route 9W, but that's a route change. And you know what? We'll pay you money. So the memorandum of understanding is if your local official will support this project wholeheartedly and do exactly what Chippy asked them, they will, yes, sir, they are plowing up Native American cemeteries. They will literally pay us $8 million. Oh, wait a minute. It's $8 million over 40 years. Well, where's the $8 million coming from? It's coming from the IDA. Worse is the None of these documents are filed. Lisa has the Rockland County documents and folks, I really say you need to read them because I can't make it up. They took the financial negotiation out of it, filed it on the Public Service Commission website and the commission has no idea that we're being bought lock, stock and barrel like sour fruit. So our elected officials are out there saying it's a great project. The MOU establishes their behavior. So when Chippy says, we have a hearing, I need you to support it. That elected official gets on a soapbox and says, this is the greatest thing since Swiss cheese. And it isn't because the industrial development agencies are the ones funding the money we're getting back from Chippy. It is such a... What's that three card Monty thing? This is so absolutely repulsive. And last thing I'm going to give you is Chippy has removed, taken behind closed doors the negotiations with the DOT, with the Coast Guard, 
So you don't know what those construction methodologies are and their last filing, they want to become a franchised utility in New York State. And they just slipped it in there quietly, hoping no one would notice. This is a bank coming into the utility world saying we're environmentally clean. And if anybody remembers the banking disaster, that's how good we're gonna get treated. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> okay. Can I tell them all the documents you have? I gave you everything? No, uh, uh, we're, we're gonna send everything out in a follow-up email. So um, I wanna get to the Q&A because we are running out of time, but uh, I think people, you know, if people want to stay later, I think we could do that. Um, okay, hold on a second. Find my... Okay, so thank you to all the speakers. Um, we are gonna now begin the Q&A segment and you will be able to turn on your video if you would like to. Gregory or I will read your questions from the chat. And when your question is read, you can unmute yourself if you want to elaborate or clarify something about your question. Otherwise, um, please stay muted so everyone can hear the questions and answers. Okay, so, oh my God, where, where is my, sorry, I just lost my screen. Okay. Uh, so everyone can be seen now if you want to be. Gregory, I, I don't know what Yes, that should be. That should be switched now that participants can unmute themselves as a oh, there. You can do so for dealing with Q&A. Did you want to? Yeah, there was a lot of posts generally. So I'm I don't still know if you want seeing to... Susan's screen. So is, is that what um, I'm seeing? I, I mean, I put up our slides actually. So it's showing like oh, something okay. about Q&A. So maybe there's something that's updated on your screen yet. Okay, okay. let's uh, let me try to. I already entered questions in the chat box. Okay. Uh, let, uh, let me go to the, the uh, chat and see where, okay. Oh, okay, here's a question from Kathleen McCarthy. The case is made by Hydro-Quebec that methane for megadams is only present for 15 years. Please explain why that is not the most relevant question and what the impact of greenhouse gases is over the long term for these dams in Canada. One argument for Canadian hydro is speed. It exists and is ready to be used. It will reduce the greenhouse gases quickly, which is the goal. Does this argument hold water? I, I, that sounds like a question for Brad. Yeah, okay, uh, so I'll take that. Uh, so first of all, the, uh, the uh, published record from Hydro-Quebec is that methane emissions uh, increase slightly uh, after a dam is built. Uh, they, don't, they don't decrease, there's no systematic decrease. So uh, the carbon dioxide decreases, uh, but, but not the, the um, methane. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, basically, uh, public relations, uh, uh, people from Hydro-Quebec feel pretty unconstrained by, by the facts when they're making their promises. So uh, you can hear a lot of promises being made, but that's why you need to go back to the, uh, the scientific uh, you know, publications. Um, and the question of, uh, I mean, I often get this, this, this thing, the, uh, the plants are already built, why don't we use them right away? Well, uh, there are two reasons. Uh, uh, one is that they're not particularly clean. And um, it would be better to uh, you know, use the funds to develop clean energy nearby. Uh, but I think the real thing is that uh, there is no excess capacity going forwards. That is, uh, Quebec needs all the electricity that it can get hold of for its decarbonization uh, projects. And so uh, you know, the commitment to export uh, hydroelectric was made uh, not taking into account the increased uh, demand that Quebec has. So if Quebec exports uh, hydropower to the US, they're going to have to make up the shortage of power uh, somewhere else. And right now their cheapest uh, source of power is uh, coal-fired power plants in New Brunswick. So uh, uh, Hydro-Quebec can make money selling hydro to New York 
uh, and buying coal from uh, New Brunswick to, uh, to uh, replace it. So oh. it's not a net benefit to the planet. Thank you. Um, a question from Clifford Krolik. Recent satellite imagery seems to show extensive heat pollution from reservoirs and ponds, thaw lakes. Could you comment on the extent of this heat pollution in terms of methane and positive feedback loops now in permafrost? Could you speculate since mega dams reservoirs are around for, for 60 plus years as to whether these dams have possibly initiated the pos positive feedback loops? Okay, so um, yeah, first of all, uh, when you build uh, a power plant and, and, and make a larger lake, uh, the, uh, the lake absorbs almost all of the sunlight that's hit, that, that hits it. So, uh, you know, uh, trees absorb a lot of sunlight, but water absorbs even more. So it is a net uh, input in the amount of heat uh, that is, uh, you know, that's uh, absorbed in the area. And, and yes, there is evidence that, that ponds and reservoirs, uh, you know, the solar heating uh, causes melting of, of the uh, permafrost. Uh, so I'm not an expert uh, on that. Uh, I know it's happening. I've seen, you know, I've been uh, last summer, I spent uh, up in permafrost and, and, and watched, uh, you know, the landscape collapsing uh, as a result of the warming temperatures. Uh, but I think the main driver of those warming temperatures is greenhouse gas emissions globally, rather than uh, local heat sources from, uh, from, from lakes. So, it is an effect, and 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 it will be uh, important locally, uh, and uh, it is part of the positive feedback. Uh, but I don't think it's uh, the driver, is, is my opinion. Um, Ian Brown, oh, was did someone else was someone saying something? Okay, um, Ian Brown says, are are you including embodied carbon for those calculations and comparing hydro, wind, and solar? Okay, so I need some uh, explanation. I'm not sure what embodied carbon is. If, if somebody knows or could- Ian, Ian Brown uh, there, can you unmute yourself and answer? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think yeah, I saw, like I'm might, sorry, I saw on the uh, chat that Ian Brown left. Oh, so okay. He's not going to be able to answer. Uh, so okay. he can follow up by email if he would like. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Clifford Krolik, could you comment whether you believe that since these reservoirs heated by solar radiation and maybe chemical reactions of melting permafrost could, oh, this is, sounds like a similar question. Huh? Um, could it be the reservoirs in the north when being drawn down only in winter? Do you think that the Arctic Ocean is being heated when the discharge of reservoirs goes through the dams is released into the Arctic Ocean? Yeah, so my answer is, is similar. Certainly that's the case. Uh, the, these reservoirs, reservoirs absorb heat in the summertime and then uh, that's when the water is being stored, and then those the water is dumped uh, into the Arctic Ocean and, and into the St. Lawrence uh, in the winter time. So it is an addition of, uh, of heat uh, at that time, and in fact, it's a net addition of heat because uh, you know if the things were just flowing naturally, uh, there would not have been as much heat deposited in the summer. Uh, but uh, again, I, I think that this is a, a small part of the positive feedback. I, I think it's not the driver. Uh, but it is yet yeah, one additional yeah. positive feedback. Thank you. And uh, would you be open to sharing this slideshow publicly so we can revisit the slides we had to skip to fit the time constraints? Yes. So let me apologize about the time constraints. But yes, as soon as you tell me where to send the slides, I will send them to you. You can just send them to me and, and I can send them out in the, the follow up email to everyone. All right. Yeah, if you make sure Lisa has them, then we can make sure they get to, yep. the, uh, to the I, audience. I, I will do that. Yeah, no, I, I think everything I've said here, I'm happy to share. Great, great. Okay, let's see. Gregory, do you see, uh, if you see a question, you can. 
Right. Luke's got answered sharing that. Just as, as a reminder, this is being recorded. We'll be sharing this on our YouTube channel um, in the coming days. Um, and we'll also update uh, the attendees accordingly as well. Well, uh, and uh, Brad, someone would like, uh, Marion Ewan would like, she says, um, Professor Hager's explanation is hugely important, wondering if he would consider making a standalone <laughs> video. <laughs> I tried reading the graphs and the verbal explanation really helped. Okay, so this was the dress rehearsal and I can, I can get a, uh, uh, another <laughs> run. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly I would, I would consider doing that. Yeah, sure. That's great. Um, let's see. I think the next one is from Tyler Chase asking Professor Jackman, wouldn't these findings mean that EMFs are harming humans too? Oh, sorry. Uh, I would presume that if, well, first of all, they're mostly away from humans, but uh, if you were, I, I, I request anybody just dubiously, uh, or what I'd like to say is, I don't think anybody would put their child on that cable. I don't think anybody would want to stand near those uh, 1,250 uh, megawatts. So when people say it's safe, I don't believe it is safe to be around. Um, you know, we worry about high tension wires in impoverished communities and, you know, potential cancer linkages. So I would be really concerned being near 1,250 megawatts of power. And the problem is there's potentially, if Chippy gets in, there will be another cable inserted into the river too. So we're talking about 2,500 megawatts of power, and that's what the fish would have to contend with. You know, the problem is that the Hudson has been abused and so have the creatures that live in it. And, uh, you know, we know that um, high-powered, high, high uh, high-tension lines uh, and fish near electromagnetic fields uh, develop or, all kinds of problems with organogenesis and, you know, uh, developmental problems. So I don't think it would be safe for people either. Yeah, also, as you mentioned, um, the, the cable will, you know, dislodge all of the, this, toxins in the sediment of the river, which oh, well, that's, that's a massive problem, problem for people. And also there are seven towns that get their water. Seven communities, the Hudson Seven, that get their drinking water. And Chippy even admits that there will be elevated levels of PCBs in their drinking water. And, you know, we're, we're talking about, it's not just there's cadmium, there's uh, chromium, there's all kinds of toxic metals from years of legacy contaminants from industrial waste that was dumped in the river. That's all going to be remobilized through the food chain and into the drinking water uptakes. And then and every time they do maintenance, it will be the same. And worse, as Chippy has said, it's they've issued a revised uh, environmental impact study and said there is no issue at anywhere at any point in an environmental discussion in and Rockland they were County. They mandated to do a, a test for PCBs and pockets mm -hmm. of contaminants. They never did the test. No, nobody's looking at the document. I mean, I got off on a rant. I do apologize, but nobody has read or nobody is double checking. No one knows what Chippy hasn't done, much less what they're paying the elected officials to be quiet about. Right. Um, Brad, uh, there's another question for you about the um, methyl mercury. Could you comment on the methyl mercury issue around oh, the sure. dams? Yeah, so I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. I, uh, I am not an expert on, on methyl mercury. Uh, but I have spent about you know ten months uh, of my life uh, canoeing in the area of these Hydro Quebec area uh, reservoirs, and and so I, I've, I've got to meet the, the people there, uh, and uh, you know they make their they make their uh, some of their subsidence uh, by by fishing, and just the way that in increasing the water level dissolves the carbon in the soils, it also dissolves the uh, the mercury that's been de uh, deposited in the circles. In, in the soils. And so this mercury dissolved in the soils goes uh, into the fish. Uh, it goes up the, up the food chain. And so, uh, yeah, uh, it's unsafe to eat the fish uh, from, from these reservoirs. So it's, uh, it's a, a real uh, serious problem uh, for the people there. 
Um, after listening to Mr. Jackman's presentation, I wonder what happened to the environmental impact study that I'm sure has to be done to move this project forward. Has an EIS been done and what was found? It so was done and I can provide you the links and you will be horrified. What they have is a very pat answer that states, we've reviewed that. And it doesn't seem to be an issue. And if we have an issue, we will deal with it at the time in which we face it. It's for our, our fishes, many of whom are endangered or, uh, or depleted. The problem is we won't know the answer. This is essentially an experiment. We won't know the answer for 20 years. And by that time, uh, Chippy and Blackstone will have come and gone and only the fish will have suffered. This is, uh, um, this is about money. It's only about money because this is an extension cord that goes from Hydro-Quebec who will be supplying all of the electric into New York City. And the one thing that didn't get mentioned is in at NYU at an environmental conference, a Champlain Hudson Power Express manager piped up and said, it's a great thing. This is a bi-directional line. So which way is the electric going? Into New York City or back to Canada? Secondary, they have no winter requirements to deliver. Third, in all of the documents, there are no parameters to what they have to supply. Chippies, Final environmental impact study states, it's on the Department of Energy website, we will provide primarily green energy. If you look at what their fleet is, if you look at how they get their energy, there is no way to tell what we're getting. There is no parameter, there's no guideline, there's no mandate. Shippy can basically do what they want. They've paid their bill, they've put their money in the meter, and they're gonna take it all away. So the commission has gone to sleep. There are no environmental controls. I've been screaming about eagles until I, I, I don't know what to do because we're gonna lose them. They're gonna blast at Iona Island, which was a munitions dump during World War II. They stopped allowing the public on Iona Island in the 60s or 70s because there was a Boy Scout camping trip. And one of the young men came up to a scout leader and said, look what I found it was a live hand grenade. So what happens if they decide they're gonna blast the ridge on the Westchester side of Iona Island, which they're going to have to because they can't go in the federal channel and they blast that ridge. What, the, the, there's fish, there's bombs, there's a, a possible explosion. Can they blow up half Westchester and Rockland while they're at it? Because they don't know. They have not done the study to determine if blasting anywhere near Iona Island is safe. Let me answer that. It isn't because it will destroy not only our fish population, the American eagle, the, the, the fauna. I, Somebody has to explain to me why Governor Cuomo chose this project and why Governor Hochul is so intent on seeing it built and why Bill Moreau is still walking the halls of Albany. Here's a question for Susan. Oh, before we jump to that, Lisa, Sorry, it might yeah. be with the acknowledging the time. Mm. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, what time is it? 8.05. Um, oh. <laughs> Real quick, Chippy's bought three parcels in Stony Point. They're also going, and Mr. Jackman, this may be something we need to discuss. At the old Merritt power plant on the banks of the Hudson River, there is a 285 foot coal ash pile into the river. If they jet plow through there, we know it's leaking. I can give you the DEC letters. If they disturb that vein any further, how much of that coal ash is going to hit out into the river? And I don't need to be a, a doctor to tell you it will be exceptional. It's 285 feet of over 40 year coal ash that has sat there and has literally just grown 
exponentially. I mean, I don't know what's in the pile, but it's leaking in the river. Okay. So I, I just wanted to say, if people want to stay, we can continue with some more questions. And uh, there, this is another question for Susan in the chat. Um, has this project been approved and signed? What can be done at this stage to oppose it? Finally, what green energy producing alternatives exist? Those are a whole nother seminar. However, here's what we can do, and I will send the links. There is on the set on the night uh, yesterday, there was a, a public hearing where it should be, they need to have their certificate of public compatibility reconfirmed. It needs to be approved. We need to get now, the Riverkeeper's got an excellent website and the link there goes right into the Public Service Commission. We need to demand that this project not be built, ask for further environmental impact studies, ask for transparency, ask for where all the construction, I'm talking too fast, I'm sorry. Ask for where all the construction documents are, Where's all the negotiation with the Coast Guard? The tugboat people are not happy. We are going to lose access to the Hudson River. He may have to, Mr. Jackman may have to put John Lipscomb in a closet because you can't, it's a federal, I, they're going to have a right of way. It's probably about 25 to 30 feet wide. Will Mr. Lipscomb be able to do what he does so very well if he can't get access to the river. And what Chippy has refused to acknowledge is they are going to significantly impact access, the quality of, as well as the quality of, of all of us. What they're doing on land is just as bad. But Riverkeeper has an excellent thank you, has an excellent, excellent site. And Mega Dams is another one, has an excellent, excellent, excellent site. You need to write a letter and say, why haven't you addressed? And, and keep pounding away. We need like 5,000 letters to go into the commission in like five days and say, you've gone too far. We don't need this. They are not environmentally sound. They are not green. I don't have Mr. Hager and Mr. Jackman's qualifications, but it's not. We don't need it. We don't want it. Help us learn how to provide green, sustainable energy that will give us jobs within our community and help our community grow, not provide a cash register that goes ching for Blackstone and Hydro Quebec. Right. And there, there's um, a question about alternatives. Now, I know for a fact that NYSERDA got seven different proposals, many from in-state uh, solar and wind development, also, there's offshore wind has been stalled for years for, you know, because of nimbyism and red tape and, you know, just the government not, you know, doing much to, to push it through. But offshore wind is a great source of energy. The mm -hmm. winds blow pr pretty much all the time out in the ocean. One of my favorite pet peeves is when I bought my house in Stony Point, I was on oil. I didn't want oil in Tompkins Cove. I didn't want oil. I went to natural gas. Same time I went to natural gas, I invested in a pellet stove. I got grief about that too, but I invested in a pellet stove, which lowered my overall carbon footprint. Homeowners, residents really do not do the very best we can. I invested in windows. I've got great windows. I've used caulk. I've learned how to wrap my hot water heater. Everybody says, well, that's not, yes, it is. If 10,000 people go out and buy a blanket and they're special blankets, folks, you cannot put a blanket on a heater, but for your hot water heater, they make special blankets. You would be amazed at what you could sell. How about wrapping your pipes that are against the wall? It also save you in case they freeze and break. How about recycling? How about looking at how we use in a home, how we use our energy? How many of us leave our TVs on? How many computers have you got going? How many printers do you? Take a look at your carbon footprint and figure out how to reduce it and you'll be amazed. And maybe these, all of us environmental groups need to say, you know what? We're gonna home grow some ways to conserve. It's one of my pet peeves. Yeah. 
But, uh, you know, we, I, we need to electrify our buildings, but we need that electricity to be supplied by clean energy. And, you know, we could- Electric grow, is uh, not the best heat, but okay. Oh, it, well, actually I have some and it's very good. Like I'm gonna, okay. heat pumps are really good, mm. but, but it has to be supplied by clean energy, not- um, Right, uh, absolutely. Gas and oil and dirty- But if you put in good windows, if you wrap your hot water heater, yeah. if you put solar outside lights out, you'd be amazed at what you can oh, see. Oh yeah, all that is definitely important also. Okay, any other questions or? Okay, <laughs> then I guess we can uh, wrap it up. Everything's been said. Hey, great. Thank Thanks. you everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you all for thank being you. here. And as, you, and as you'll see up there, our next uh, forum is going to be on EVs in New York City coming up next month on March 16th at 6.30. You can always visit uh, greenhomenyc.org for more information on our programs, events. Um, so QR code there if you want to scan to see about volunteering. Thank you, everybody. To volunteer. Oh, thanks for coming, Cliff. Um, and once again, yeah, thank you all for joining us this evening. Mm -hmm.